Welcome everyone to ChessLecture.com. My name is International Master William Pascal, and um, it's my special pleasure to bring you a game that I played myself. This is not the first time we've done this on the site, but I want to initiate a new series here on our site, which is a self-analysis of our own games. As Mikhail Bufanik, who was world champion, very much believed, it's of absolute importance that you understand and analyze your own games. So, with this game, I would like to start a new series here on ChessLecture.com. And the following game is C. Nanu. My opponent is from Romania against myself, William Pascal. A very interesting tournament played in Predial, Romania, um, in the mountains. And um, my opponent is rated 2508, myself 2353. And um, very interesting game on many levels. Not just the opening, not just the middle game, but the end game is very interesting. So I thought this would be a perfect game to analyze on all three levels. Nanu versus Pascal. Here we go. So Nanu opens with d4. Little story about this tournament. This was played in the middle of the tournament. There was a double round. In this double round, the only double round of the tournament, there were two games to be played in one day. This was the second game played in one day. The only day in this tournament where two games were played. So there was no time to prepare for either myself or my opponent, really, for one or the other. So basically, we're on our own. Neither side, I believe, seriously prepare for the other. So my opponent played d4, Nanu, very strong I am, rated over 2500. I played knight to f6. I played various openings, sometimes King's Indian, sometimes Nimzo Indian, depending on what my opponent does. But my opponent played knight to f3. This is a good waiting move. Actually quite tricky. Good waiting move. Now here, if you really like the Queen's Indian, this is a good moment to play b6. The problem is, black can play bishop to g5 in this situation. And bishop g5 in this situation is not your normal Trumpowski. It's kind of dangerous. Um, black isn't really well developed. Bishop g5 is particularly effective against 2b6 in this position, as I've experienced myself. So I was not in particular mood to re-experience that nightmare. Here, basically, for my opening repertoire, the choice was between e6 and, and g6. I had no idea what my opponent plays, but in general, if you want to be aggressive, I believe it's more ambitious to play g6, which is, as I've done in some previous lectures, a hyper-modern system. I believe that hypermodern systems not necessarily better than direct systems, but um, perhaps less likely to involve exchanges of pieces at an early stage in the game. So basically, by playing a hypermodern system, we're avoiding early exchanges in the game, which might lend themselves to draws. So I'm playing for a win with black here. G6, my opponent shocked me with the following move. Knight on b to d2. At first glance, this move appears to be that of a complete beginner. White is violating minimally two opening principles. White is violating his bishop on c1, blocking it in voluntarily with knight on b1 to d2. Number two, he is not developing his knight to his optimal square, which is c3. So, I'm playing black here against a very strong player, rated over 2,500 feet. A. He's playing knight on b to d2. Is this a joke, or is this serious? Actually, you know, what's very strange about this position is, is actually that there's some sting to white setup. Obviously, black wants to play in either King's Indian or Grunfeld style. 
with the 2G6. 99 beta D2. What does this have to do with anything? Why are they supporting the move E4? However, why is 9 of beta D2 say better than, let's go back a move. Say, why is 9 of beta D2 better than, say, 9 to C3? The problem with 9 to C3, which, to be honest, not all that bad a move itself, is D5. The problem that arises for White here is that he's blocking his C2 pawn. The C2 pawn in so many openings is critical in influencing the center for White. So, you may say to yourself, that nobility 2 as my opponent played here, seems very passive, very silly. But in a way, it may be superior to knight to C3 because it supports E4 while not blocking the ability of the C pawn to advance and influence the center. So what should I do here? Well, the question of what black should do here is largely a question of style. I believe that the most dynamic move for black is actually C5. I've never actually played this position in my life and in checking it with the computer databases it's actually been played very few times. It's not a surprise. One problem with being a chess professional is that it's impossible to prepare for every possibility. Something like what my opponent played here, three knight on B to D2. I mean, basically, even the top grandmasters don't take this kind of move seriously. They don't really include it in their opening preparation. And I certainly didn't include it myself. So. The most dynamic move is C5. The basic idea is C5 is not a sacrifice. If C5, pawn takes C5, queen A5, queen on D8 to A5, and after that move, white simply cannot in any way defend his C5 pawn. And I believe it would be virtually impossible for white to prove a serious advantage in this position. Equality, perhaps. So, I discarded C5 for a very abstract reason. I was unsure about the following move, E4. I was unsure how to react in the event of C5, E4. But in retrospect, C takes D4. In this position, I actually was concerned about the move E5. And I considered, for example, knight to G4. Knight to G4 is very bad because E5 is securely protected. In the event of white playing H3, the black knight will be kicked back to H6 to a very passive position. But, I just discussed the following position with Grandmaster Matamoros from Ecuador. He in fact had encountered this situation and he supported my opinion that black should play knight to d5. And in my opinion, black has a rather good variation of an Alekhine's defense or a Lehin's defense because the white knight is not particularly well placed on d2. The e5 pawn is rather forward, and after knight takes d4, for example, the e5 pawn may be somewhat vulnerable. For example, the immediate attack knight to c6, what does white do about the double attack on d4 and e5? In my opinion, now in retrospect, black should react. In this position, with the dynamic move, c5. After knight of b to d2, the best reaction for black is most likely c5. Now, Grandmaster Matamoros from Ecuador explained to me that he had played a game where white, who was a strong international master, captured on c5. This is actually perfectly reasonable. 
after queen a5, we would probably continue with something like c3, or perhaps even a3. With the idea of attacking the queen when it captures on c5 with the move b4. For example, queen takes c5, b4. This position is very characteristic of what we call the Catalan opening with white. If I go back all the way to the beginning, if we can go back all the way to the beginning here, for example, d4, d5, c4, very common opening, c6, went to f3, went to f6. After the move, d takes c4, g3, d takes c4. Often this pawn, at some point, is recaptured by the white queen. It's possible to play queen to a4 check. More common is bishop g2, bishop e7, castle, castle, and now queen c2. Also queen a4 is possible and perhaps equally viable. And black simply gives up the pawn on c4 with a move like a6. And queen takes c4, or b5, gaining time on the enemy queen. This is a position I want to draw your attention to. Very similar to the possibilities that exist in the game annotating now. So, quickly going back, d4, knight f6, c4, g6, excuse me, the actual move order was knight f3, g6, knight on b to d2 without c4. Now, what should black play here? What is actually threatening to gain space with e4? I believe that it's perfectly acceptable for black to play a quiet move here, bishop g7, allowing e4. And you might think this position resembles a very conservative opening like the Pierce defense, but actually White is playing a Pierce defense with his knight on b to d2 rather than on c3. This cannot be dangerous for black. So if black wants to retain a flexible structure, it's better to just develop with bishop g7 rather than committing a central pawn. But I was in a particular mood in this game to punish my opponent's move. I said, what would the computer do here? d5. Surprisingly enough, when I checked with my best computer program, d5 was considered the best move. Now my opponent took me by an um, absolute shock. In this particular position, I anticipated either e3 or perhaps c4, breaking in the center. Both moves quite viable. My opponent played b4. Now I remind you that my opponent was rated 25-10 and he also won the Romanian Open, the 2007 edition, um, ahead of 10 Grandmasters, 20 International Masters, and um, innumerable other very, very qualified players. So. Winner of the tournament versus yours truly, b4. I was taken completely aback. My memory went back, and I remembered one grandmaster from England named Keith Arkell often played something he called the speckled hen, which was something like uh, very early b4 against the Grunfeld in a slightly different move order, but this is a very, very poisonous move. I was shocked by what the computer suggested here. For example, if you put this in computer program, queen d6 is one of the main suggestions. Very violent move, directly attacking b4.
I find this move very, very hard to believe. Attacking a pawn with an early development of the queen. Is this a really good move? I seriously doubt it. So, I went with pure development, bishop g7. My opponent played the following move, e3. I castled. My opponent played c4. I had a very, very bad feeling about this particular position. As a King's Indian, Grudfeld type of a player, what should black do? In the King's Indian, your normal pawn break, and by the way, if you haven't seen my lectures on pawn breaks, you should check out pawn break lectures here on chesslecture.com. Um, Jesse Cry and myself, William Pascal, we have done various lectures on pawn breaks. So here the question is for black. Where are the pawn breaks? Where are the pawn breaks? It's a very funny position. There are no pawn breaks, ironically. C5 is completely ruled out by white's moves B4 and D4. E5 completely ruled out by D4 and Knight F3. This particular setup, I have to credit with a particular grandmaster from um, Czechoslovakia, Grandmaster Maduna. He is actually kind of like the creator of the system, as I come to learn. Um, it turns out that International Master Nanu, quite a strong player again, over 2,500 feet, had, had never played this exact position before. He played the moves very quickly, but this is actually Maduna's setup. Maduna is a very well-known player. He played this um, setup on a number uh, numerous occasions with good results. So the Czechoslovakian Grandmaster Maduna really deserves the credit for this rather unorthodox setup that has a quite a bit of sting. After c4 it's not clear what black should do. It's possible to defend the pawn with either c6 or e6. It's not clear what black's best move is. c6 felt rather passive to me. e6 I didn't particularly like for a number of reasons. e6 while defending the pawn with the central pawn blocks in the bishop on c8 number one. Number two in the event of the white bishop on c1 going to a3 may attack my rook on f8. I wasn't particularly happy about that. Number three I would like to achieve the break e5 so if I play e6 I'm wasting a tempo in achieving e5. So I'm in quite a dilemma here. I spent about half an hour in this position which is quite un uncharacteristic for me. I don't normally spend such amount of time on one particular move. So here I wasn't, uh, I wasn't particularly happy with c6. I wasn't particularly happy with e6. I decided to play the experimental move knight on b to d7. Inviting my opponent to take the center with c takes d5. In the event of c takes d5, which I think is quite a viable move, black will recapture with knight takes d5. Opening the bishop on g7 profitably, attacking the pawn on b4, and making the possibility of e5 a reality. So, naturally my opponent was not so excited to bring my knight to the center. He played a solid, rational move, bishop e2. Now, in this position, I played the following move, rook to e8. My plan is very, very clear. I decided to punish my opponent. I don't have the c5 break. I decided to try to execute the e5 break. After rook e8, I'm threatening to play e5 very quickly. He plays bishop to b2. Good move. Stopping e5 for good. Now black has serious dilemmas. 
And what's really funny about this position is it's not clear what Black did wrong. I made completely natural moves, and after ten moves, rather eight moves, it's already obvious that there is no clear plan for Black. Here I made a rather routine move, securing my center, c6. My opponent routinely reacted with castles, playing very quickly. And now, I consider the possibility of my bishop on c8 being very blocked in. So naturally I consider the possibility of b6. But I disregarded this move. Because if b6, c5, and now I feel very embarrassed about the situation of my bishop on c8. It can just passively go to b7 with no prospect. So, rather than react passively after castles, I played an aggressive move, a5. And now this move disturbs White's pawn structure, but it also activates my rook on a8 from its original square. This is some factor that's not to be underestimated. It's not so common in every opening, but in sometimes closed openings, the rook can actually activate itself from its original square. So a5 is a kind of paradoxical move. It's paradoxical because I'm actually playing on the side of the board where the opponent seems to have the upper hand. So normally we would recommend you don't play on the side of the board where the opponent has the upper hand. But in this situation, I was rather pressed for an idea and a5 seems to activate a piece on a8. My hope in this position is that somehow I can activate my passive bishop on c8. I was actually surprised here. This position was played once before, and the following move was played, b5. Attacking my pawn structure. In my opinion, in my humble opinion, the move a3 deserves serious, serious consideration. Maintaining the bind on c5, maintaining control of the position, and in the event of a takes b, a takes b, rook takes a1, for example, queen takes a1, white now threatens invasions of the queen along the a-file. Under no circumstances can black possibly, possibly have an equal game. White simply has control of an open line, is good development, white is slightly better. So, I was very surprised. My opponent's reaction after a, a5, b5. Actually, not the first time that this particular position has been reached. If you see my lecture on pawn chains for beginners, this move is extremely logical. White strives to attack the base, or as close to the base as possible, of a black's pawn chain. So it's logical. However, I had an active counter in mind, which was c5. This move would not be possible if white had played a3. Very counter-attacking move. Now, some computer programs pointed out to me that white has a very strong continuation here. In fact, pawn takes pawn on d5, destroying my center, knight takes d5, queen to b3, developing with tempo. This move promises white a slight and, and the enduring advantage. But my opponent, my esteemed opponent Nanu, who won the Romanian Open, decided to play a rather routine move here, which I rather disapprove of, Rook on a to c1. Bringing a rook to the open, or rather, what I call a potentially open file. This file is likely to open because the pawns on c4 and d5 are 
in contact. Very logical move, in my opinion. Not the best, but a good move. Now here I played c takes d4. If white really wants to control the center, the move to play here is pawn takes d4, with the absolute domination of the e5 square. But in that event, that pawn on d4, after d takes d4, by black, now that pawn on d4 becomes a kind of weakness. So he didn't want to play a, a, a particular pawn structure where he has an enduring weakness. After my move c takes d4, he played bishop takes d4. Double-edged move. Positionally good, maintaining a very good pawn structure, but allowing e5, a very dynamic move by myself with black, with tempo. Now my opponent played a very dubious move, in my opinion. The best move is bishop to b2. For some reason, my opponent felt that bishop e2 was perhaps weaker because the piece was undefended on that square. Some vague reason why bishop b2 may be inferior. There is no concrete reason why bishop a b2 is inferior to any other square. My opponent played bishop a1. I was very, very happy to see this move because in some variations, if the bishop is on b2, it may go to a3 with the very volatile effect on black's weakened squares. So I'm quite happy to see this move. Now e4, gaining space. Knight d4. Now I want to draw your attention to a, to a game that was played. Um, if you can reference the book, The Art of Positional Play by Samuel Roshevsky, there was a game between Larry Evans and Samuel Roshevsky, where the pawn on e4, black was Roshevsky, white was Evans, the pawn on e4 played a very, very key influence on black's total control of center. So although white's knight on d4 is essentially a monster piece, essentially unremovable, he has surrendered space. He has surrendered the knight from f3, and he's weakened his kingside defense. After knight d4, I was concerned about the possibility of white playing c5 and c6 with a crushing pass pawn. So I felt it was necessary to capture d takes c4. Knight takes c4, threatening knight d6 with an invasion on the d6 square, which would attack my rook and bishop on c8 and e8. Very unpleasant. Played the move knight b6. Proposed an exchange of a very active piece in the opponent's camp. I actually expect my opponent to play knight takes b6, queen takes b6, followed by queen c2, with a simple invasion on c7 threatened. White has an enduring slight advantage. But, my opponent did not see fit to do that. He made a very, in my opinion, very poor move here. After knight takes c4 and knight b6, Nana, who actually won the Romanian Open, makes a lemon of a move. This is actually a terrible, terrible move for a player who won a very strong Open tournament. h3. You might say to yourself, what in the world does h3 have to do with this position? Well, I think in the back of his mind, my opponent was thinking that in the event that he moves his queen, I might exchange my bishop, which hasn't even moved, for his good bishop, so-called good bishop, on e2, with the maneuver bishop g4. So he was overly concerned about some kind of vague possibilities of bishop to g4. But with this passive of h3, white goes from better to worse. In fact, white 
is suddenly in serious trouble. Very serious trouble. What's shocking about this position, where I felt I was slightly worse, is that that piece on C8, which was so passive, couldn't move, suddenly has the B line against the pawn in H3. It's a, it's just a sacrifice waiting to happen. And my poor opponent didn't envision that in the future, and it's very, very sad. H3. There's nothing I can do directly as of yet, but the following menacing move, knight on F to D5. Multi-purpose move. Opening the bishop on G7. Threatening menacing things like knight to B4, harassing the pawn on A2, invasions with knight on B4 to D3. To play the following move, queen D2, very poor move. Missing really the danger, the inherent danger of the position. In one moment, white is in grave danger. Knight takes c4. Now, in the event of the natural bishop takes c4, black has at his disposal knight b6. In the event of bishop to b3, a very strong rejoinder a4 with grave and rather a serious space advantage. So, instead of that, my opponent rather naturally played rook takes c4, which is not so evident, and suddenly, after queen g5, white is in grave danger. White is in very, very serious danger. The bishop on c8, which has not even moved, suddenly threatened bishop to h3 with a crushing attack. And white has no choice but to play king h1. My esteemed opponent who won this tournament was terrified. He spent about half an hour on that move. After queen h6, he continued to spend about 20 minutes pondering my eminent sacrifice Bishop takes h3 with a devastating attack. He came up with an absolutely devious solution. I really have to give him credit. Although not absolutely sound, the following move, played after 20 minutes thought, saved my opponent from imminent destruction. Knight f5. Absolutely, absolutely brilliant brilliant defense. The point is, bishop takes f5, queen takes d5, or bishop takes g7. He played bishop takes g7, queen takes g7, and now, I had disregarded this possibility because after queen takes d5, it's obvious black can win the exchange with bishop e6. But, international master Nanu was a very fine understanding of position, realizing the danger he was in, decided to sacrifice the exchange for a pawn. And here I was rather short on time, after the rather unorthodox opening, he played queen takes b7. Now, queen takes b7. Normal move. At this point, I have a very good invasive move, queen b2. Attacking many things. The a2 pawn, e2 bishop, indirectly the f2 pawn. White has no choice but to play rook e1. Very, very awkward move. Passive move. Passive and putting a rook on e1, which is unprotected. Essentially creating another target. Now, I could simply take the exchange here with bishop takes c4. I was afraid to do that. This is my mistake. I was afraid to be materialistic. But it's probably black's best chance. 
After bishop takes c4, bishop takes c4, queen f6. It's really not clear that white has enough compensation for the exchange. In my opinion, he has just about enough compensation for the exchange. He has a pawn and a very, very strong bishop on c4, dominating f7, as well as a very strong pass pawn on b5. I was very short of time. I was reluctant to go into this position. Probably this is black's best chance to win the game to go for a pure materially advantage. But I think that objectively, white has good chances to draw. Being very short of time, I was reluctant to go for a material advantage. I was very, very low on time. I tried to find a clear path to equality. Instead of queen b2, rook e1, bishop takes c4, I played rook on a to b8, playing with a white queen. In the event of queen takes e4, now I'll take on, happily take on c4, when white has to capture with the queen, which is not nearly as threatening as a bishop on c4. My opponent wisely played queen a7. Now here black can minimally equalize with queen takes b5. But, again, very short of time, I was hoping my opponent, which he actually should, probably repeat position with queen b7, he played queen to d4. Now here white can play for equality at the most. Queen takes b5 is the best move. My time shortage, I believe that I was exchanging into a drawn endgame things become very complicated. After queen takes d4, rook takes d4, bishop takes a2, I had the idea that my outside pass pawn was superior to his pass pawn in the b file. But international master Nanu had a little surprise for me. Bishop to d1, brilliant move. Very, very nasty move when you're short of time. Suddenly, I can't play my plan of a4 and bishop to b3, locking in this monster a pawn. He's stopping my advance, as well as trying to defend his pass pawn on b5. Very, very unpleasant. I played rook on the a c8, threatening rook c1, pinning his bishop on d1. He played rook a4, hitting my bishop on a2. Now, in this position, rook c1 is possible, with the idea of rook d8. But I decided to play the position very simply. Bishop to c4. With a forcing variation in mind. A transposition to what is a theoretically drawn endgame. Rook takes a5. Rook a8. And again, if you're interested in this kind of endgame, check out my endgame lectures on rook endgames on the same side of the board. Rook a8. Rook takes a8, rook takes a8, rook takes a8, bishop c2. Now, it's very important I eliminate that pawn on b5. But, what we want to do here is limit things down to a very basic endgame, if possible. The more pieces on the board, the more difficult the draw can be if you're a pawn down. I want to play a pawn down, but I want to play a pawn down with a minimal amount of pieces on the board. Bishop d3. Bishop takes d3. C takes, rather, e takes d3. G4. Disgusting move, in my opinion. Just creating the possibility for black to exchange pawns in, this, in the next several moves. Rook d1 should be played, preserving pawns back try to keep the pawns on the board. Instead he played g4, terrible blunder. Rook b8, and now rook d1. Rook takes b5, rook takes d3, and now you understand why g4 was so weak. h5, simply trading pawns. The more pawns on the board, the better the winning chances 
for the side with the extra pawn. With g4, he simply allowed me to trade pawns to a theoretically drawn position. h5. This position is a theoretical draw. My opponent tried pathetically to prove to me after the game that the game was actually possibly winning for white. I think that any top grandmaster would laugh in his face. In fact, including myself, um, absolutely ridiculous claim. This position is an absolute draw with correct play for black. So, after rook takes b5, white to move. King g2. H takes g takes back, and now we reach a theoretically drawn position with three pawns against two. Black plays a waiting move, king g7. Very important. Not necessary, but possible. I put this position on my computer. It was very, very excited to play f5. Exchanging pawns or attempting to do so. I believe it's much safer not to do so. There is no need for black to risk opening his king. King g7, much safer. f4. Rook a5. Maximizing distance of my rook. Now g5, gaining space, binding my position. In this position I played rook a4, just cutting off the white king. King f3. Now rook a1. Now that this king is at a distance, I'm threatening checks from behind. I'm going to quickly go through this part of the game. Been a rather long lecture. After rook a1, e4, gaining space. Rook f1, check. Natural move, king e3. Now it's just a matter of waiting. I want to tie him down to the pawn, the base of pawn chain, on f4. I've got him where I want him. I've got him tied down to f4. So now it's just a matter of waiting. King g8, what can you do to me? He has no plan, rook a3. And simply king g7. Rook a5. King f8. Rook a6. King g7. And now rook f6. Very good move. Freeing his king from defense of the f4 pawn. A good try, but not enough. I simply wait. King g8. And the white king tries to stroll, but the white king has no protection, if you notice. From checks from the rear, as well as checks from the side, there's no protection for the white king. The white king is hopelessly open. So king d4, played rook a1, flexible move, threatening checks from both sides, rook d6, rook a5, cutting off the white king, rook d5, clearing the way for the king, rook a6, threatening in the event of king e5, rook e6 check, sending the white king back, very accurate move. After rook a6, my opponent played rook to d7. I responded with rook to a5, cutting off the white king again, preventing a f rather f5. Rook d5, repeating position, draw on game, rook a6. He's frustrated here, f5. What other chance? I trade another pawn. g takes f, e takes f. And despite the claims of International Master Nanyu, this is a completely drawn position. After pawn takes pawn, pawn takes pawn, king g7, absolutely 100% drawn. White cannot win, does not have a passed pawn. King g7, rook d7, nice try. Threatening a very serious move, g6, but there's no time. Rook a1, with a very nasty threat of winning his rook, 
with rook d1 check. Rook b7, saving the rook. And the checks begin. Rook d1 check. King e3. White is helpless with a series of checks, followed by attack on his pawns. Rook e1, king f3, rook f1 check, king g4. It's rather king e4. Rook e1 check, king f4, rook f1 check, we reach move 60. King e5. Very good instructional game, and the end games are instructional. Rook e1 check. Checks do not stop. The king is open. King d6. Rook d1 check. King d rather e7. King rook to d to e1 check. King d8. The king is unstopped from perpetual attack, and drawing with rook e5. My opponent looked very disappointed here. However, he happily went on to win five games in a row, as well as first place in the Romanian Open. So good for him. Rook e5, g6, forcing a elimination of all material. Rook takes f7, rather f5. G takes f7. Rook takes f7. Rook takes f7. King takes f7. And yours truly drew with no material left against international master Nanu, champion and winner of the Romania Open 2007. Very instructive game, very interesting opening, very interesting middle game, very interesting end game. I'd like to thank you for joining me here for my analysis of my own games, part one from chesslecture.com. Thanks again.